welcome to the show, David Diamond and David Weissman. Thank you so much for being on the show, guys. Thank hey, you thanks. for having us. Thanks for having us. So first, before we even get started, I have to tell you, I am a huge fan of one of your films that you uh, that you wrote called Family Man with Nicolas Cage. It is one of my favorite Christmas movies ever. And every year, that and Die Hard, obviously, um, <laughs> are both the films that my wife and I watch every single Christmas. So uh, I, I have to ask you a few questions about that before we even get started. Sure. How did you like come up with that concept and how like that whole project get put together? Because it was one of your early films, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes. Yes. It's the first film. It's the first film, uh, studio film that we got made. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the idea, we were just sort of sort of playing around with the idea of, you know, a guy sort of wakes up with a family, whatever. But then we were sort of playing with this idea of what if there was a, a computer or something that could calculate the every decision that you made and what the paths going forward are and right. there would be billions of different uh, different choices and and i don't know how that idea just then sort of came out of it this guy what if you know one choice was different one big decision was different and where that life would diverge and then that was the rest was that and we i mean that Amazingly enough, that pitch, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we pitched that movie, uh, it was one of the first things we ever sold. The pitch took half an hour to pitch, Come and on. much of the dialogue that's in the movie was in the pitch. Really? Because uh, yeah. what, what I find what I find fascinating about this, well, first of all, it was only it was a pitch that got yeah. you the job, which is a rarity nowadays to get yeah. a job Beva off of a pitch. Correct? Is that is that fair to that, say? Absolutely, it would be very difficult to do that now. Yeah. Maybe impossible. <laughs> exactly. But what I love about the film so much is that it grows with you. So when I first saw it, I didn't have kids and I didn't yeah. have a family. So when I first saw it, it came out in what two thousand and two thousand. 2000, yeah. right? Yeah. So when I first saw it, I was like, oh, I just love the movie. But then fast forward 10, 15 years, and I have kids and I have a wife and and my wife is the same thing. We're like, wow, it's just you look at it so differently when you have children. Yeah. Right. Well, it's it spanned the same thing for us mm -hmm. because when we first wrote it, um, this David was just, I think, starting the relationship with his wife, right? Uh, I was just dating my wife when we sold the pitch. Right. I, I remember pitching it to her uh, on a train, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. right after we sold it, before we were married. And when we were, but our, our daughter was six months old when we were shooting, shooting the movie. So it spanned... So I was single throughout the whole thing. So I was like you when you first saw the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, the experience was always the other guy. He was New York Jack and I, I was, was New York Jack. Because <laughs> New York Jack looks fantastic. Nicolas Cage in New York. He's yeah. got all the money and the power and the women and all. Life. It's just like – but then at the as and you get older, I want him over to my side. He yeah. became it, New Jersey Jack. <laughs> exactly. But eventually, as you grow older and you get a little wiser and more mature, hopefully, you realize that New Jersey Jack is kind of. A much better place to be yeah. as the character goes through in the movie that is true although i think you know one of the um thoughts that we always had about the movie as even as we were making it was that it's not so black and white mm -mm. that uh you know you make certain compromises or sacrifices or life is a negotiation uh, whichever life you're living, uh, yeah. you give certain things up to have what you have. And it's just a matter of deciding where your priorities are. That's what the entire movie is about, is defining your priorities. Now, and, and, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. And I was just going to say that, you know, taking taking great love for granted is is something that, you know, a lot of us do when we're super ambitious and young and pursuing mm -hmm. that thing. And I think um, there was a lot for us in that because, you know, as writers, uh, we also had these conflicts of, you know, what do you give up for your career? What do you, and now of course, the, the place we all end up or many of us end up is in the family situation. And that's the thing that endures. And that's the mm -hmm. thing that, you know, for us is, the absolute priority now. Uh, so we've we've gone on the same journey that you have, I think, ab about the movie and with the movie. 
Yeah, and you you just don't want to be the creepy guy in the, in the club. You just don't want to be that dude. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you just don't want to be that guy. I mean, like, okay, I've seen it. Like, I seen. I remember when I was clubbing back in the day, and you see that guy who's like fifty five, mm. and he's just hanging out trying to pick up twenty year olds. I'm like, oh, is that? Yeah, that There's... sounds super creepy. And I can tell you from <laughs> personal experience, when you have a twenty year old, Ooh. it becomes more creepy. <laughs> I have twin seven-year-old girls, and yeah. I don't even want to think about that. Right. Yeah, but right. just oh, but there are stages in life, and I think that's something that when you're young, you don't realize. You think you're going to be young forever, and this is the life you're going to live. But as stages go on in life, you do make those changes, and that movie just makes it so wonderfully put together. Uh, so thank you again for making that film again, and and every Christmas, Dad and Die Hard on the Blu-ray player yeah. on the Blu-ray play list. Watch Die Hard more often. But. <laughs> Arguably yeah. the greatest Christmas movie of all time. I, yeah. I, I, I know Bruce says it's not a Christmas movie. I don't care. It's the greatest, one of the greatest Christmas movies of all Absolutely. time. <laughs> now, so let me ask you, how did you guys, first of all, how did you guys get together? How did you get into the business? How does this work? Uh, so uh, on one foot, we went to high school together. So we've been best friends since we were 15 years old. Oh, wow. We parted for college. Uh, I went to NYU David went to Hebrew University in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and then University of Michigan. And then after college, I moved out here to L.A. with some friends from school and um, I was working for a producer. And during my year doing that, that's when I realized I wanted to be writing movies. So uh, I left town to do that for a little bit. And part of the time I was gone I moved in with Dave, who was in graduate school at University of Wisconsin in Madison, and uh, he was studying Chinese history. And I was a, prerequis a prerequisite to be a screenwriter, obviously. Of course, sure, of course. <laughs> yeah, Ma. There you go. That's the extent of his Chinese. Now. That's all I remember. Um, and uh, about four months into our time together, living together in Madison. We had an idea for a script and he was finished writing his master's thesis and I was finished writing the script. I went there to write and we started writing it. Yeah. And uh, and that started a process that uh, took a few years, I guess, while each of us was writing. We were writing together. Mm -hmm. Anytime he had a break in his academic calendar, summers we would spend together writing or if I was on winter break, I would go find him and we would write together. Um, and we were also writing separately. And uh, and then in 1991, 91, we made a decision. We made yeah. a decision that if you know, the stuff we were writing together was getting more traction than the stuff either of us was writing separately. We just decided that, you know, if we really wanted to be serious about this and do this, we should do it together and make a commitment. So he dropped out of grad school. Yeah. And he moved out here. And, uh... I dropped out of grad school, and uh, on the three-day drive from Providence, Rhode Island, to Los Angeles, I forgot every word of Chinese that I had learned <laughs> in the previous eight years. <laughs> Fantastic! So, and you just... guys, so you guys get out here. Obviously, the money—they just start throwing money at you. Obviously, right away. Yes. Correct? Right. So this was a, another. Uh, in retrospect, it's funny. It wasn't funny at the time, but. <laughs> We sort of cemented this partnership on the cyclone at Coney Island. Yeah. We went for a ride on the cyclone. We're like, we're going to do this. No surrender. And I told Dave that I really feel like if we partner, we will be successful within a year. And he, he guaranteed it. He didn't just tell me. It's like it's a year. I One did. Year. I did. Twelve months. It. Twelve yeah. months. I guarantee it. I felt, and I felt, frankly, at the time, I was being kind of uh, conservative. I mean, <laughs> a year—that's long enough for us at the time. It was long enough to write probably three screenplays. How, how, how old are you? How old are you at this point? <laughs> we were twenty-five, I think. Twenty-four? <laughs> no, no. Twenty-five. In the, we were in our twenties. Mid twenties. Mid twenties. Yeah, we were in mid twenties. And uh, so, you know, he does the thing. He drops out of grad school. He tells his parents, I'm dropping out of grad school. They love that. <clears throat> they loved oh, it. Fantastic. And, yeah. To be a screenwriter and, uh, in L.A. Fantastic. Yeah, right. fantastic. And I'm moving out to L.A. to become a writer. Yeah. They so uh, we move in together. We start writing. Cut to a year later. <laughs> and we are, when I tell you, we are no further along than when we started. Nothing. I mean, nothing. 
Not no, even you knew nobody else that you didn't know a no. year earlier. <laughs> We and were, not we only that, every meal at Subway, every meal. But sure. I had I had started uh, dating someone at the time, not my wife. Mm-hmm. And uh, and one day I came into the apartment and I said to him, you know, I'm dating this girl and I'm starting to think like I, I might one day want to get married. I don't know if this is going to work. And he looked at me like, there was a guarantee. I gave up graduate school for this. This is a guarantee, no. man. <laughs> So I was like, oh, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. I said a year, okay. Uh, but the truth is, it, it took two years. Two, oh. Yeah, a couple of months over two years. We had actually, with um, about a year, I moved out in January of 1992. In March of 1993, we had written and were making a, um independent movie um for a company for for Cinetel that was like a a sequel to like a you know sort of a mildly successful title they had for which we were paid I think twenty five hundred dollars mm-hmm. so we don't really consider that our first that wasn't really success it mm-hmm. was about a year later uh, I believe it was April of nineteen ninety four that we sold uh, our first spec so and that was what really launched our career great and then how did so you and you I'm assuming you found an agent or something like that during that time. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We had uh, an agent who had read one of our earlier specs and responded to the writing in the script. He didn't think he could sell the script. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a story that we tell in our book, which uh, we'll talk about in a bit. But uh, it was an effective writing sample. And he said to us, "I, I don't think that I can sell this, but I like the writing. And if you come up with an idea that's a little more in the mainstream, we can really launch your career. And we sat down together and talked about ideas and chose an idea. And uh, we we wrote that script and he sold it and launched our career. And, yeah. what's, and what, did that script ever get made? That never got made. No. The script was called The Wiz Kid. We sold it to 20th Century Fox with a young <laughs> Elijah Wood attached to Star. And uh, it just sort of went off course in of development. Course. Sure. Um, a very typical development story, um, but you know it really, both in the way it was sold because it was sold as a spec, there was a uh, a blind script commitment in the sale, so mm-hmm. it was like one of these big sales that gets in the trades, and you know with one thing the agent had said to us when he was when we were discussing what to do because he read the script that we wrote and he liked it. And he said, basically, look, I could send this out. I could get you a few meetings. Maybe out of one of those meetings, you come up with an idea. You pitch that idea. You get paid Writers Guild minimum to write it. You could go that way. But there's a there's maybe a better way, which is write a different script that's a big idea, sell it on spec, make a big splash, and suddenly you're sort of entering the business at a different level. And we took his advice, which was – really the best advice I think anybody had ever given us and maybe the best advice we'd ever gotten because it, maybe the only advice we had ever gotten. <laughs> it was, it was ever took. But it, exactly what he said came true. Uh, that's what happened. And we had the good fortune of sort of entering the business at a slightly higher level than, than we would have had we not sold that spec. And out of that, you know, uh, uh, out of that deal, there was a blind script commitment, and that that became a script that we wrote called Guam Goes to the Moon, which was really the script that we wrote that kind of made us sort of well-known in, in development circles at the studios, and that script really sort of um, became almost like a brand or something that people really knew of ours. And then Family Man uh, was the next thing we sold, and that was the first one to get made. And it only took five years. So, <laughs> so one year tops. Yeah, one year, one year tops. tops. From the guaranteed. time, from the time that he told <laughs> me to come out here, uh, which was in 1991, to Family Man getting made in 1999. Nine, right. <laughs> eight years. So thank you very much. And that film was a, f- a fairly big success for when it came out. It was a studio release. It did very well in the theater, if I remember correctly. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like a, it didn't make a billion dollars, but it did, it did well for a movie. Yeah, it wasn't a style. blockbuster, but it was a solid, it was a solid performer at the bottom. It was one of the successful movies of, of that Christmas season. Yeah. And it's, and had, it, it's had amazing legs. You know? Yeah. So I was about to say it must, it still it plays all the time and I see it all the time. Yeah. It's really, um, it's a movie that I think has, as you say, and, and this was very, I, th- I think very per- perceptive. The movie has aged well, I think, because it, it ages in the same way that people's lives ages, you know, the values that it was sort of about. I think people appreciate it and they watch it every year. And I think that um, it's that's been that's been wonderful for, for us to see. And in our career, it's been a it's been a great thing. It was also, you know, I mean, it was really the first thing. It was the first studio movie we got made. It was yeah. a really exciting time. Um, we were on set all the time. They, they, we weren't rewritten. We sort of every one of the Hollywood cliches about studio movies did not apply to this. We were really, really respected on set. Uh, we were young guys, but treated as much more seasoned veterans. And um, uh, the director was was you know was 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 super inclusive of us. The actors super inclusive of us. In fact, the joke that the producers said about us was. They, they kept saying, you guys write like old like old guys. And they, they meant it in a nice way. Of course, yeah. <laughs> it didn't right. actually right, – right. you know, now that we're old guys, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think it came out that way. But but I think what they were saying was there was a maturity to the writing that they really appreciated. And, and I think that sort of reflected in how the movie has aged. And uh, one last thing, and we'll leave Family Man alone after this. Uh, it is Nicolas Cage being very Nicolas Cagey, which is, <laughs> which is so wonderful. It's, it was just oh so great. <laughs> He he was so amazing too, uh, when he he sort of inhabited that character oh. in a way that we never you couldn't you can't imagine it until you see it happening. Mm-hmm. And I remember the four days of rehearsal that we did for that movie as being really one of the most exciting things that had ever happened in 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 my career in our career because it was the first time we got to see what he did with his character and the life that he gave it and it was completely unexpected in so many ways and that's his i think that's his genius is that he took that that character that we had sort of imagined for a long time because we've been working on this movie for over five years and gave it life that we hadn't imagined and uh it was pretty great that's what good actors do Yep. That was really a gift. And I, I wish it for all of your listeners that, yeah. <clears throat> you know, a really good actor takes lines. There were lines we thought they were jokes and he didn't play them for jokes at all. He played them 100 percent committed to straight. Yeah. Straight. Yeah. And then there were other lines that we did not think were jokes <laughs> that coming out of his mouth were so funny. Yeah, that's true. So uh, it was every scene was a surprise and it was always a pleasant surprise. So you guys have sat down and now written a book about screenwriting and the screenwriting process, which I have to say an amazing title because the title of our podcast is the Bulletproof Screenplay uh, oh, podcast. So, you know, when uh, when Ken reached out and said, hey, there's this book. Do you guys want to, t- you want to talk to the authors? I'm like, well, of course, Bulletproof has to be on the Bulletproof <laughs> Screenplay podcast. Um, so the book is called Bulletproof Writing Scripts That Don't Get Shot Down. What was the concept behind the book? Because, I mean, there's, there's, I think, a couple of books on screenwriting, not too many, but just a few. So I wanted to know what you, <laughs> what you wanted to throw, uh, you know, you throw your hat in the ring and what you thought was going to be different about your approach. Yeah. So the first thing that's different about our approach is there are, as you say, there are a lot of books uh, on screenwriting out there. There are not a lot of books on screenwriting that are written by people who have Mm -hmm. made movies produced by movie studios. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that sense, we're part of a a smaller group. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, we haven't read a ton of these books uh, from what we've seen. Most of them really do have something at least uh, valuable to offer. Mm -hmm. But what we felt we had to offer was our 25 years of experience writing movies for movie studios. Mm -hmm. And the specific approach that we take in the book, in addition to um, looking at the process from the perspective of developing character and ideas and sort of from the bottom up, is to look at the process simultaneously from the top down, meaning what are 
managers and agents and actors and directors and studios and financiers and marketing people, what are they looking for from this idea and from this process that you're about to uh, embark on? Because without a partner, you're not selling your movie or getting your movie made. Mm-hmm. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, writers may write in a vacuum, but movies do not get made in a vacuum. <laughs> so what we were trying to do in this book is, you know, we're trying to answer all the questions we've ever been asked by people who are trying to write movies and write for television and uh, and share our experience a big piece of which is the realization that when you start working on something, you really have to be able to envision who's gonna make this movie, where is this movie going to be released, how is it going to be released, how is it going to be marketed, who's gonna be in it. Uh, These are all questions that, that need to be considered throughout the process. Yeah, and I, I find that screenwriters uh, don't think about things like that because they're just all about the art or the right. of the or the craft of of the story. But they're like they they they'll spend six months on a screenplay, but they have no idea how they're going to sell it. They have no idea what the marketplace is looking for, or if they're looking for something like this, or even if it's an original idea. You can have. I mean, look at Family Man. It's a great original concept. Um, I don't think the marketplace was like, we need a family, man. Like it wasn't yeah. something that they were asking for, but it showed up at the right place at the right time. And, and you had ideas about how and where it could go. I think a lot of screenwriters don't think that way. And I think this is a great idea for a book as well as the other stuff that you teach in as far as craft is concerned. I think, I think that's very true. I mean, screenwriting is different, right? I mean, when it's, it's, I think the one kind of writing that, that you do that when you finish, it's really just the beginning of a process. And so <laughs> you don't really have anything other than a screenplay. And as far as I know, selling a screenplay uh, that hasn't been made into a movie is something that no one has ever done. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, nobody – people read screenplays of movies that have been made, but they rarely – outside of the business read screenplays of movies that haven't been made. And so for us, the probably one of the biggest epiphanies we had in our career was the moment that we realized that we aren't going to get anywhere in this business if all we're doing is trying to amuse each other. Because first <laughs> of all, we are easily amused by each other. Obviously. Been, right? Okay. Obvi- obviously. Obviously. Stay in a room together. And we try to make each other laugh. We've been doing that since we're literally 14 years old, trying to make each other laugh. And it's one of the most satisfying things we can do. That being said, no one else cares. So when we when we realized this, it was such a such an sort of inspired moment for us because it it, it brought everything into perspective about um, a, this as a collaborative medium and and that if we were going to do this successfully as professionals, we had to, from the very earliest stages, start thinking about all the, the stakeholders down the line who we need to get this movie made. And in, in so doing, I think um, it helped us in our career, but um, it's also one of the one of the biggest things that we've tried to um, we've tried to give other people who ask us for advice as as people do. And, uh, and, and we decided, you know what, let's, let's put it in a book. Let's, let's systematically sort of dissect what we, what we've done and how we do it. And maybe it'll give some insight to people. Maybe, maybe it'll be helpful or not, but, uh, you know, we think it's been, it's been helpful for us. So we hope it'll be helpful for, for other people too. Now, what is the biggest mistake or thing that you see that makes you cringe in first time screenplays? Cause I'm sure you've read a couple of them in your yeah. life. I I think um, what people think is story and what is actually story <laughs> are very different things. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, a lot of people I think assume that uh, if something happened to them and they found it interesting or fun or or or, or meaningful, um, and 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 that's not to deny that it isn't interesting or fun or meaningful for them. But it's not necessarily a story that will engage other people. And I think that, um, you know, 
I, I, there's so many mistakes that you can make along the way uh, that um, are, are, are typical mistakes. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even know, like, we still make them, you know, <laughs> we make them all the time. We, we're guys that we don't nail anything till like the 10th draft, really. Like right. we are, we are serial rewriters and, uh, and we know we have to be because, you know, for us, the process is a long process. So maybe the biggest mistake a screenwriter can make is showing an early draft mm -hmm. to somebody who is in not just a an advisory role, but like a decision making role. It's a huge mistake. But isn't it isn't it the definition of a professional who goes and sits down and does ten drafts as opposed to the amateur who will release the second draft maybe. saying we're good. We're good. I think right. this is one year, one year. That's all we need. One year. Right. Yeah. Just one year. It only takes one year. It's just one year. Move out to LA, quit graduate school. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> but isn't that truly the definition of a professional? A professional sits there and understands that they have to pound it and pound it and yeah. tighten and squeeze and chisel, whereas opposed 100%. to leave it out there and just like, oh, it's second draft. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think also a big difference between the professional and the non-professional and uh, one of the biggest mistakes we see people make uh, is there is a certain point in the process where your movie reveals itself, mm -hmm. where it starts to be clear. And you can tell as you're reading someone's script, oh, I'm on page 65 and OK, I get what this movie is trying to be. I get what this movie is supposed to be. You haven't really delivered on that, but it's clear to me what it's sort of asking to be, what this idea is asking to be. And uh, I think a lot of us, including the two of us, uh, have a tendency um, to want the movie to be what we want it to be. There's a certain point where you have to sort of mm -hmm. give it over to the idea and let the idea be your guide. Uh, that's hard to do. But uh, it's also very liberating in a way if you if you can do it. But a lot of times when you talk to writers about their scripts and say, well, I wanted this or I wanted that. And, uh, you know, we get that. But at a certain point, it's not about what you want. It's you have an idea and this is what your idea wants. It's a be of service to the idea, to the story, Correct. as opposed to your ego. Correct. What I want and I want to control, which I think writers in general have a control. We're control freaks because we like to control the whole world that we're creating. But in many times, you're right. That idea is that wild horse. You just got to let it go. If you try to hold it in, it's not going to do well for you. Correct. And if you listen, if you're a control freak, screenwriting might not be for you. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> because you don't control anything. I mean, maybe if you're. Steven Soderbergh and you're a writer, director, editor, cinematographer, everything. Okay, right. then you can. But, you know, even even a director in in this Ever. business has to count on so many people being creative in the right way to make mm -hmm. something great. So it's not a good it's I don't think it's screenwriting is a good career for control freaks. But I think you're right that tons of control freaks become screenwriters <laughs> without, so. que without question. Now, what yeah. is the difference between an idea for a movie and an idea for a screenplay? Uh, well, we've only had f probably five ideas for a movie in our career <laughs> because I think that's all that have been made into a movie. Okay. Uh, we've had about 700 ideas for screenplays. So maybe it's a percentage thing. What do you, you think? You know, the, the, the screenplay is a document that's formatted in a particular way. Right. And so if I wake up in the morning and I say, oh, I had a dream last night, I think it would be a great idea for a movie. <laughs> and I start writing and I write for three days straight and I write 90 pages and I have <laughs> character names sure. and there's dialogue and I can even have special effects. And my dream is in there. That's a screenplay. That's a screenplay. <laughs> um Making some sense of it, what that's about, what the themes are, how the characters grow from the beginning to the end. If yeah. I don't have that, I don't have a movie. And so uh, yeah. for us, that's really uh, the difference between writing a screenplay and writing a movie. And, you know, thinking, I think a lot of writers, when they start, they're inspired by things, as Dave was saying before, that have happened to them or feelings that they have that they want to get out this is all very useful good stuff to think about and write about but uh if you don't really figure out the full idea of the movie and the growth of the character 
and uh, what the theme of the movie is and the whole world that you're going to present in your story, then you do not have a movie. You may have a screenplay, but not a movie. Uh, and and uh, mind you, not, not every movie gets made into a movie, right? I mean, we have lots of screenplays that are movies that have never gotten made. But if you write one, even if it doesn't get made, it will help you tremendously in your career because the one thing that every development executive and director and manager and agent worth um, anything can do is identify a movie. They're good at it. People, you know, you, 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 you can't fool, you can't fool them. So it may not get made because I mean, this is a business. They cost a lot of money to make a movie, taste change, style change, whatever. Politics. Yeah, sure. Politics, whatever. But if you've written a movie, it will help you. Now, so that's why it's a worthy goal. How many screenplays do you have between you in your career? <laughs> I, I, I'm, an there's a point to this. There's a why point to this. Such an embarrassing question. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know, like a hundred probably. Right. Something like something like. I mean, I, I think something that ridiculous. Just <laughs> since, uh, just since we turned professional. In 1994, I think that they're probably around 70. Yeah, and then there's at least 15 that we wrote before we were professional, right? Or more. Yeah. And then you know there's fragments of another dozen more that we never finished. Right. I don't know. It's an there embarrassing a, number. It's it, well, it's not embarrassing. I don't look at it as an embarrassing because I, I asked the question for a specific reason because I think that so many screenwriters just show up quitting graduate school, showing up to LA, <laughs> and they have the one screenplay. And they they spent if they spent four years on that one screenplay and yeah. they have everything on it where that is an amateur move where a professional, like you just said, was amazing. Like before we turned professional, we had 15 screenplays. So you had the experience of going through that process 15 times. I'm sure you learned a lot during that process to the point where when you turn professional, you probably added another 15 or whatever before you started really yeah. – gaining them, but you need to go through that process. You need to kind of go through that. And that's something that most screenwriters, especially young screenwriters, they don't think because they think that one idea, that's, that's the one that's going to make them a billion dollars. And it's not that it's a numbers game. Yeah. Well, it it's, is, it is a numbers game and it's also, you know, this is, we talk about it in the book. This is the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 yeah. hours rule, yeah. Oh, yeah. right? This is, this is when you learn and how you learn your craft and you practice it and it's batting practice. You yeah. know, you don't step up to the plate and hit a home run in the major leagues the <laughs> right. first time you swing a bat. Right. You got to go through little league. You got to go through the minors. You got to go through all the all the steps before. There are no shortcuts. Yeah, and even how the many... geniuses, even yeah. the geniuses have to do it. You yeah, know? Michael, Michael and... Jordan practice and practice and practice until he became. Exactly. And exactly. he was, and he was arguably much better than all three of us put together on on our best days. Uh, That's right. <laughs> it, it doesn't even compare to his worst day when he had 104 degree temperature and he still won the That's game. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We what a once game. wrote a great scene when we had 104 degree temperature. <laughs> Amazing scene. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, what advice uh, can you give writers where they can find inspiration? Because a lot, I mean, the inspiration, finding that well of inspiration when the muse doesn't show up, all that kind of stuff. What's your advice on that? Well, I think those are actually two different questions. Okay. You know, one thing is, one question is, where do you find your inspiration? And the other question is, what do you do when your muse doesn't show up? <laughs> okay. Right? Okay. The truth is, if you wrote only when you were inspired, uh, oh. none of us would get anywhere. <laughs> right. you know, there would be no movies would get made. <laughs> you know, this is a job. So, uh, you know, Dave and I, we work bankers hours. We take our kids to school. We show up. We work from, you know, eight to four, four thirty. And then we pick our kids up and we have dinner with our families. When he says eight to four thirty, he means ten to ten to twelve. You know, yeah. Something like that. I, I could read between the lines, sir. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so you, you got to show up every day, whether you're inspired or not. I think that any anyone who's inclined to do this probably has their own um, access to inspiration, whether it's music or other movies or uh you know, wherever you find your creative muse, you know, everything's on the table and everything's legitimate. Uh, I think that the bigger, more important question is, what do you do when the muse doesn't show up? And the answer yeah. is you go to work. You go to work and you have you have to 
you have to be inspired by the prospect of success because if you don't believe that you're going to be successful, why do it? You know, you, it's going to be really hard to do it. I think every screenwriter has to really believe that, you know, I can be successful and I can do this. And by the way, you know, we're, I think screenwriters, we're a pretty average group of, of people. You know, we're not, I don't think we're a group of geniuses. Mm -hmm. I've, I've met a lot of writers in my life. They're, they're, you know, they have, they share certain qualities, but, um, they, they work hard at it. And, you know, if you work hard at it, I think you can probably, you can probably do it at least learn to do it at a level that, um, if you're dedicated enough and, and you have some modicum of talent, you can do it successfully as a career. But if you don't think about the result, if you don't think get inspired by like what could happen, I think it's going to be hard to finish your, your work for the day. The other thing I would say is you should be excited not just by the prospect of your own success in your career, but you should be inspired by what the particular project you're working on can be because there are going to be days that are going to be very difficult. You're going to be dragging. You're going to be facing a problem. You're not sure how to resolve it. And uh, if you're not excited about the overarching idea that you're working on and about the prospect of delivering the screenplay of that idea and seeing that movie on screen, even if it's on your phone, um, it's going to be hard to get through the difficult days. It's a little bit like marriage, you know, uh, <laughs> some days are better than others. Touche, mine sir. It's great every day. Yes, mine too. I don't know what you're talking about, uh, David. Too. <laughs> Honey, if you're listening. <laughs> well, it's very similar to what Stephen Pressfield said, which is this, like you just show up every day and you just let the muse know that I'm going to be at this desk every day between right. 8.30 and 4.30. That's right. If you decide to show up, this is where I'll be. But every right. day I'm going to show up, and that's the only way. You just got to keep, keep cranking. It's completely yeah. true. Now, um, what is the anatomy of uh, – or actually, better yet, how can you write – or build a bulletproof character, in your opinion? So, uh, writing a bulletproof character uh, is, a, you know, you have to answer certain essential questions about that character. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you're starting with a character that has something that they want uh, and something that they need. And, uh, the evolution of that character is really about them figuring out the what they need, uh, starting from what they want, pursuing what they want, overcoming obstacles, and uh, coming out the other side having achieved something that they never really knew that they needed. But uh, that's the journey that that's the journey yeah. that you're watching. And the way we build those characters is what we do, and we write about this in the book: is we create a chart. Uh, we list every single character and uh, where they are in the beginning of the movie, what their goal is in the beginning of the movie, and we track them through the entire movie, looking at the uh, everything that happens from the perspective of every single character. Uh, and that helps us create not just characters that grow over time, but scenes that are much more dynamic because you have characters with different perspectives, points of view, uh, you know, yeah. coming at each other. And you see in, you know, in, in a script, pretty much everybody who writes a script can, can sort of tell the story from their main character's point of view, because it's, it's what inspired you to write it. And it's really, it's really the main story you're, you're telling. What we like to do is do it for every character. S look at the movie, um, from the perspective of every character who's a major character in, in the in the script and what that allows us to do is um, you know often tell five six seven eight individual stories and I think it, it definitely will help you in terms of sort of figuring out not just how this movie is about your main character but how it's about sort of these ancillary characters as well now can you talk a little bit about subtext because I think something that's something that's so missing from so many screenplays in today's world my my screenplays included that it's very on the <laughs> nose very on the nose kind of stuff and it's like I don't like you I don't like you either and that's kind of it as opposed to doing it with a look or 
you know, uh, many other different techniques. Can you talk a little bit about subtext in your characters or in your, in your stories in general? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we don't write with subtext because that's extra. We charge no. extra for that. <laughs> you know, it's funny because um, we've been mostly comedy writers for sure. our career. And I think that um, humor is often subtext. Um, yeah. You know, you can't... Uh, What's, when a character says something funny or does something funny, when there's something funny that happens in your screenplay, it can't just be two characters saying what's on the surface, saying what's on their mind. It has to be sort of a clash, I think, of, of deeply held views. And um, you know, subtext is, is incredibly important because your characters are, are talking and doing things in a movie, but um, they're often not not saying what they really think, and they're often not doing what they really want to do. So, um, you know, tone is so important, and um, all the things sort of behind the writing are incredibly important. Uh, and we probably, I think, um, you know, this is something that when you're on your 10th draft, as we often are, this is when you really start discovering subtext and where we're layering layering those things into your screenplay starts happening. And it's and it's like what you say, you know, if you're just handing in your first draft, you're not going to have the subtext unless you're some crazy genius. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a while to figure that out and find that. Um, so I think also that a lot of subtext is about this distinction between what a character wants and what a character needs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if your character's goal is, for example, we were talking about Family Man earlier, this character, what he wanted was just to get back to his old life, mm -hmm. to physically return to New York and live in his apartment and have his job. That's what that character wanted. But that's not what that character needed. And so for a lot of the time in that movie, as he's talking with his wife in New Jersey, played by Taylor Leone, he's having conversations where he's still very much focused in the conversation, in the dialogue, on wanting to get back to the life that he had before. But this is not what that character needed. And ultimately, the subtext becomes text, where in the third act of the movie, the character starts speaking very directly to what they need. And... Uh, that's that's when, uh, that's when the magic, when the magic happens. happens. That's, that's when, when the magic, magic happens. Yeah. Well, if I if I if, and if I might have an example of of a little bit of subtext in Family Man, where he goes shopping and he gets that suit when he starts mm -hmm. trying on that suit. Sure. And then when she's like, "We can't afford that," and all of a sudden it becomes so much more than about the suit. Obviously, there's so many more deeper feelings, and this comes out in the argument what it really is about. But Correct. originally, it was just like, I want to buy the suit. Well, like, you can't buy the suit. Like, it's not about the suit. <laughs> was that a good example? That's a great example. Yeah. It's a, that, again, that movie is all about priorities and how you prioritize personal relationships, family, and career aspirations and ambition. And that's what the suit scene is about. He wants his $2,000 suit. He feels like a better man. <laughs> But he's, but is he a better man? Yeah, it is so. It's well, such a ridiculous cut when he says that. I feel like cringing when he says like, "I feel like a better man wearing this." <laughs> like that says so much about his character and where he is in his life at that moment in time. Like I'm like, if I'm wearing this, I feel like a better man. Like that's, oof, says volumes. And yet I have to say, when you put on a two thousand dollar suit, I have yes. You feel, I don't know if you feel like a better man, but you feel something. You feel something. <laughs> but here's the thing. There's something in that fabric. When we were There's writing something. that scene, one yeah, yeah. of us was a father. And the truth of being a father is you never get that suit. No. You're all, right? I mean, no. it's like um, you're, you're sort of always giving up on the suit. Look, so look I, I think it was it was sort of you know anticipated what it's going to be like for us. Well, like, like I always say, if you look behind me, I have a life-size Yoda. Yeah, sitting in my in my office. I bought that when I was single before I met my wife. Can you imagine the conversation right now of me walking to my wife and going, "Babe, I think uh, I think I need a life size Yoda, and uh, 
I know the kids have summer camp coming up, but I, I but I need a life size Yoda. It's an incredible value. It's an it's gonna only appreciate in time. It's an investment, really. <laughs> like, can you imagine having these conversations? So I, anytime I meet single guys, I'm like, dude, buy any crazy thing you right. want. Now, that <laughs> life now. time to do it. That life size Hulk that you've been wanting that cost six thousand dollars on eBay, buy it now because that will not have that will not have happened in about You'll five years. You'll never get years. that. Never happen. Yeah. Never never. How much it, was the Yoda? The Yoda when I bought it was like 300 400 bucks at the time. It has you probably, probably sell it for thousands now. It's probably now in the range of 800 to 1000. I check every like 3 or 4 years I'll check eBay just to see where it's at. <laughs> but it's probably like 800 to 1000 bucks now probably. It's from 1999. It was from the Phantom Menace release. It was the one that was in Blockbusters and, and they only had like in all the Blockbusters it was like a giveaway of Blockbusters and I bought it. And now it's part of the family. I'll never get rid of it. it you know, my girls were raised with Uncle Yoda. I mean, it's part of the thing. <laughs> But the point is, that is my suit. Like, I can't have – if you look behind right. me, there's, like, statues of, like, the Hulk and Wolverine yeah. and stuff. They all cost, like, three dollars $400 a piece. Again, before children came. Right. I was yeah. married, right. but before children. Not when the kids come. It's, it's – yeah, it's – yeah, before BC. Yes, yeah, before children. I, cannot, I can't have that con- – I can't go to Comic-Con anymore and go, babe, I, I, I'm going to spend 600 bucks at Comic-Con. <laughs> I'm going to do that. That conversation won't happen. So yeah. – we have skewed off the topic, but this is yeah. a life okay. lesson for everybody listening. <laughs> All, right. Any young writers listening, buy crazy stuff now. Buy it now. If you take nothing system. from this podcast, <laughs> take that. We have take. just – eBay is now $20,000 richer because of us. <laughs> Someone's buying a life-size Hulk as we speak. <laughs> By the way, I do want that life-size Hulk, but I don't even know where I could put it because it's so damn big. <laughs> you know, I – I see right behind you. You could put it in that chair next to the Yoda, and it's perfect. It's like eight feet tall. Literally, it won't fit. Oh. In the, it won't, literally won't fit in my room. So, yeah. But I've, I'm letting go of that a little bit. I'm letting go. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, now, what other question I have for you guys is, what can screenwriters do to make their uh, their script stand out, or them to stand out of the crowd? Because even when you guys were starting in the 90s, it's a lot different world. Even when you got Family Man made than it is today, I mean, arguably Family Man probably wouldn't get made today in the studio Correct. system because that's not the movies that they're making now. Yeah. Yeah, Family Man would be hard to get made today. And many of the scripts that we've sold, and I, you know, I listen, it's, there's no question about it. There's an arms race in screenwriting, right? In, in terms of shocking people or creating, you know, crazy set pieces or or all these things. I mean, I really feel like if you want your script to stand out, make the reader feel something. That's always, always some. It's something that never goes out of fashion and something that that, that people will right. always respond to. Right. And it has nothing to do with the arms race of shock value or. Um, things that are that are kind of crazy. If you make somebody feel something, it's undeniable. And uh, it, listen, it might not you might not sell your script for for a million dollars, but it will get the attention of the people reading it, and um, it'll lead to good things. I agree a hundred percent. I mean, the, the truth is, you may still not sell your script, uh, but you will really earn a lot of fans. People will talk about you. They'll share your script with other people. Ultimately, that's what you want. Uh, you know, what happens out here is people read stuff and for them to take it to their boss, you know, you put your, you put your neck it's a risk. out there. It's a risk. You, what's that? It's a risk on their it's part. It's a risk, right? So if you're going to ask somebody else to read something, you have to at least be able to say, this really moved me. I thought this was really wonderful. Uh, and um, and no one will ever resent you for making them read something that, that moves them. You know, even if ultimately they're not going to buy it. They may say it doesn't fit in here. This is not our brand. They may say that. But if they're moved, they'll never regret having read it, and they may hire you to write something else. And it doesn't matter what genre you're writing in. It's a horror movie. It's an action movie. It's a comedy. Whatever it is, make the reader feel something. People that, want to be moved. They want to be yeah. impacted. And the other thing that I would say is uh, write something – um, find your twist on uh, whatever genre you're writing in. You know, if what you deliver is a script that people feel they've 
read a hundred times before and offers nothing new, <laughs> it's hard to be inspired by that. Right. But uh, if you can, um, if you can do something in a way that's a little bit different, that has your own unique spin on it, that's very helpful. I mean, uh, talking about being moved, I mean, arguably, and, and everyone listening will now turn off because I'm going to talk about my favorite movie of all time. But it, there's a reason why it's Shawshank Redemption sure. is one of those films that arguably anybody that I speak to says, well, that's that's just great. And if they don't like it, they're dead inside and I can't speak to you. Um, <laughs> that's just obviously, I mean, do you, I'm assuming you guys are fans. If not, we can just end the conversation now. Yeah, <laughs> and I actually showed it to my kids not that long ago to my sons. And uh, now it's one of their top movies. And these are kids who are growing up in the Marvel era. Right. And that's the thing that because I saw it when I was just out of high school. It was like 94 yeah. when that got released, something like that, that year. Great year for movies that year. And and I remember that like my friends who were in high school who like thought John claude Van Damme was the greatest actor of all time. They said that, my God, that was a really good movie. It had penetrated all of the ignorance and the, 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 the just the non nuances of, of being that young, like you did with your sons, probably who like are growing up in the Marvel times and said, wow, that really hit me. And I've yeah. studied that movie and I've studied that script so much. And I always ask any screenwriters I, I have on the show, I'm like, what is it? Like, what? Like, because it's the worst name in history. It's Terrible. the worst pitch in history. Like, there's nothing like of any sort of value in the way that they present the idea. But yet it cuts through everything and now is considered, you know, if not the best, according to IMDb, one of the best films of all time. But yet there's no reason it should be. And, you know, so I always ask screenwriters who are fans, what do you think the reasoning is behind that film? I think it taps into uh, our desire to believe in the good things in life, in hope and friendship. Um, I mean, those are the two things that survive in that movie. And um, and that's that's what prevails in that movie, hope and friendship, hope, faith, friendship. Uh, if those things are important to you or resonate mm -hmm. with you, then it's hard not to be a fan of, of Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, without question. That's what, like, like I said, if, like you just said, if you're a fan of hope and friendship, uh, you're going to like it. So if you don't like it, you're obviously not a friend. <laughs> you yeah. obviously don't like hope or friendship, and you're dead, so. and you're dead inside. Mean, why, do, why do people like Springsteen? <laughs> like, you either do, I mean, well, Springsteen, I love Springsteen. How can you not love Springsteen? I mean, come on. There you go. <laughs> I mean, but I'm from, a, I'm from a different generation, so are you guys, but I know the boss, and I, I, I remember him, and I still remember his stuff, but he's one of the, how do you not like the Beatles? Like, how can you not, you know, look at the Beatles and go, damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, again, skewed off course, but we're now back. And one last question I want to ask you. Uh, rewrites so important in this process and we've kind of touched upon it any tips on rewrites and how to do that chiseling because we originally start with a really big piece of marble and like michelangelo says he just chisel away and reveal the david but that is a painstaking thing anything any advice any tips you can give us yeah i think by the time you get to you know it is sort of like you say, it's like chipping away and revealing a statue. You know, by the time you write your 105 pages or whatever it is, you should at least be able to see the blueprint of the movie that you're hoping to make. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should be able to achieve some clarity. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, if you go back to the beginning and articulate the idea that's driving your movie, who is your character? Have I gotten the most out of the concept for this movie? Have I introduced the best possible obstacles? Um, and you need to make sure that the draft that you produce responds, uh, responds to those questions. Is this the funniest movie I can write? Is this the scariest movie that I can write? Uh, it's just about sharpening, sharpening, sharpening. And it's also about giving your script and when you're ready to, to people you very, you trust very much, people who are close to you and getting feedback from them and really trying to discern from the feedback that you get, have I com effectively communicated the idea that I'm trying to communicate? Are people getting this? And if they're not getting it, why are they not getting it? And what do I need to change? And if they are getting it and they have suggestions, are they good suggestions? 
Uh, you, you know, are they, should I do what they're saying in the way that they suggest it? Or have they identified a problem that I'm not going to address in the way they say I should, but I pay attention to the fact that they found a problem that's real and I have to find another way to address that problem. Now, that's, a, that's a big thing is um, not, is, is looking at the notes that you get as indications of an issue or a problem, but not necessarily a solution. The solution usually comes from within the writer. And at least that's what we found is that, you know, you're the expert on, on your own screenplay, but that doesn't mean if somebody has an issue with something that you've written that they're wrong. And, you know, what's hard about rewriting is that you grow very attached to the things that you love. And there may be <laughs> things that you've written that you love. But that doesn't mean they belong in the script. You know, the idea is the only thing sacred in a script is the idea. And the movie is something that you have to find and you have to often let things go along the way that are really, really valuable things. But if they don't serve the story in the way that they need to serve the story, it's a mistake to have it to have it be in the screenplay. Screenplays have to be very efficient. You know, we we we. People aren't reading novels when they're reading screenplays. They're reading a schematic for a movie. They're reading something that has to really hold together like a movie. You're not going to get the same patience and you're not going to get the same um, consideration that you might get for when you're reading a novel. So you have to be efficient. And, you know, that means doing everything you can to service the idea. And often, you know, that's why rewriting is so hard because – You've already put the work in, you know, you're, th you don't <laughs> want to throw, um, good money after bad or, um, uh, as they say. So I think you have to be prepared to let some stuff go. It's kind of like, I, th I think, you know, the prime directive when you're, you know, when you finished your script and you're giving it to someone to read, it's don't lose the reader. That's really job number one is don't lose the reader. You have to recognize that anyone who's reading your script has 50 other scripts that they have to read. So any excuse that you give them to be able to put your script aside and pick up one of the other ones, they're going to take. So you can't lose the reader. And if anyone tells you, you know, your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your child tells you, I read it. But I, you know, on page seven, I lost interest because of X. You should pay very close attention because uh, maybe not your child, maybe not your child. <laughs> Tell what the child is. But uh, yeah, you don't want to lose the reader and anything that can help you to retain the interest of your reader from page one to page 105 is worth very, very serious consideration. As Stephen King says, kill your darlings. Kill your Kill darlings. Your, Kill your darlings. Now, you and you guys, when you guys write, you write more than one script at a time, or you just stay focused on one script at a time? Well, we often are writing two things at a time because of the particular way that we work. We figure mm -hmm. out our ideas together in great detail, um, but we do most of our writing separately until the very end of the process when we sit side by side at the computer. So for that time when we're writing, we can each be writing. So we try to be working on two things at a time, typically. So are you kind of like the Elton John model of like you guys both go off, write your own thing, and then come together and see if it works, and then kind of work it that way? Well, we're not yeah. writing our own thing. We're Within the idea. Together. Within the idea. Within the idea, you're not writing your own thing. Well, we outline together. Uh -huh. And um, so so that process is – so so by the – by the time we're ready to write, we've, mm -hmm. we're writing off a pretty detailed outline mm -hmm. that includes a lot of character and scene work in the outline. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yes, um, that we only actually will write together at the computer at the very end. Um, so there is, you know, it gives us, I think it, 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 it keeps things exciting and interesting for us. It allows us to sort of express our individual voices um, and it also allowed us throughout our career to be able to take on a wider variety of projects because we each have strengths. And so, um, there are certain things that we could do because it played to one or the other strength. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been helpful to us. It's, it's an, it allowed us to work more efficiently as well.
Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Okay. Uh, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Uh, I, well, I what the, the one thing that I would say, and I would say to be very, very careful about is don't, is, is, it's, it's going to be very hard to resist this, this temptation, but do not send your script to somebody in a position to help you until that script is ready and you are a thousand percent sure it's ready. Mm -hmm. These opportunities are so rare. They're so precious. It's the most precious thing you have. And so I know, I know that, that, that people coming up today have contests and they have, uh, they have different mechanisms that maybe we didn't have, but there is nothing as precious as the opportunity to impress somebody in a position to help you. Please don't do it until your screenplay is ready. That is, um, th those really are the most precious things you'll, you'll ever get those opportunities. And picking up on something that you said earlier, Alex, don't just write one screenplay, <laughs> you know, I mean, don't, don't come out here thinking that I have an idea for a movie. I'm going to write the screenplay. And when I am done, my phone's going to be ringing off the hook and I'm going to have opportunities galore. One year uh, tops, one year tops. One yeah, year tops. One year. <laughs> this, one year. Is, this is, you know, understand that this is unlikely to happen and be okay with it and take your time and write as many screenplays as you need to write until you arrive at the one that is actually going to do for you what you're hoping it will do for you. And, uh, as we say in the book, you know, keep going as long as you're not doing harm to yourself or others. And as long as you continue to have a desire to do it, uh, you know, when we were when we were just starting out, a friend called and said, I want to do this. How long should I give it? Well, if you're asking how long I should give it, then you're, not you're over. It's over before you started. Yeah. You can't be asking that that question. You have to really want to do it and you just have to keep going until you achieve your goal or until you just don't have Care. the desire anymore. Yeah. yeah, it's the five to 10 year plan, not the 12 to 18 yeah. month plan. That's correct. I think that's that's a reasonable amount of time to think it might take. Now, can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Well, for sure, for us, it's Adventures in the Screen Trade by oh, yeah. William Holden. Comes up often. It, yeah. Well, because it's so rare that you read something that is both a guide to doing something and an expression of the greatest way that it can be done. And, you know, what, what William Goldman did in that book is he really gave you – a flavor for what it's like to, to be in this business and, 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 and how crazy it is and how joyful it is. And at the same time, I think, you know, told you how to do it. If you, if you read it in the right way. And I think we learned from that book probably more than anything else. At least that's the one for me. What about anything else that we have that was influential? I would say the Bible written <laughs> by God. <laughs> Is that the first part or second part or both, sir? <laughs> he means it. That's the thing. Um, you know. You know what? Ironically, we there's great stories in the Bible, and that's oh, there's, you know, yes. there's been many movies. Like, yes. <laughs> Talk about creating a world. Uh, it's true. Why not go back to the source? <laughs> yeah. Talk about world creations. Yeah. I mean, geez, the antagonists alone in that in that book. Anyway, um, all right, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Oh man, these are my Oprah questions. I apologize ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> if you were a tree, what kind if of tree? If I was a fruit, <laughs> I would be a peach. Um, <laughs> you know, to me, the 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 lesson that um, that sort of resonates with me the most is that you really do have to try to enjoy the process mm -hmm. as you go along and yeah. you know it's the victories aren't always going to come they really sometimes they come sometimes they don't come uh we've had the the great good fortune to be writing partners for many many years and and best friends for even longer 
we enjoy every day that we get together and and do this. It's a blessing. It's something that um, you know has 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 taken me through the good times and the bad times. And so the lesson is enjoy it, love it, love the doing of it. The results, you know, they may come uh, or they may not, they may not come, but you haven't wasted your time if you've loved the process. Yeah. And I would say along similar lines, uh, the most valuable lesson that I have learned from this is don't define yourself by your circumstances. You know, uh, all of us go through struggles, whether, you know, we're not yet professional screenwriters while we're professional screenwriters, there are struggles every day. Uh, you know, screenwriter is what we do. It's not who we are. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to see yourself as a whole person with a job to do, take the work seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously and um, and recognize the difference between what you do and who you are. Uh, it can be very, very depressing when the work is hard or when it's not coming to you uh, if that's if your entire identity is wrapped up in what you're doing. Um, but uh, if you know who you are and uh, you have other aspects of your life that are meaningful to you, then that will probably be reflected in your work. It'll probably only enhance your work. Was there was there an obstacle or a fear that each of you had to overcome in order to succeed in this in this business? Because there is so much of fear and uh, and posture syndrome and all of these kind of things that we kind of you know we we are the worst enemy we have. Our own mindsets are our worst enemy. Was there anything for you early on, or even later, and maybe during the process uh, of being a professional, that you had to kind of overcome to keep going? You know, I, I think for me, I probably was afraid of not being successful at this. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, there was a sort of creative survival instinct that kicked in where uh, the desire to be good at it and to actually understand it overcame the de desire just to be successful at it. Mm -hmm. And so the lessons of screenwriting started to penetrate in such a way that we were able to become successful, even though uh, the driving uh, the driving force wasn't the ambition. The driving force was doing it right. That was, you know, how do we do this right? That was the question that we were that we were asking and and uh, how do you do it right is a more important question than how do you succeed? Because <laughs> yeah. ultimately you succeed by doing it right. <laughs> Would you agree, David? Uh, I wasn't listening to what he said. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yes, I agree. <laughs> and now the toughest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, geez. We should be ready for that one, right? <laughs> Uh, As of our, right our favorite now, favorite joint film like oh. that we both love so much is probably Tootsie. Yes, comes up. Yeah, often. I would. I, I, you know, for me, probably because I'm going to limit it to comedies. Sure. Because I think I can't choose three, so uh, probably Ghostbusters and Step Brothers for me. Step Brothers. Uh, oh, a new one. Yeah, newer one. That's a great film. Step Brothers never disappoints. It's so good. Uh, and so Ghostbusters good. And, and Stripes for sure. I'd throw Diner in there as like a of critical course. movie oh, of our growing so up and, uh, and, and The Graduate. And also, you know, I um, have as a nod to the brief film school education I had, The Bicycle Thief. Yeah. <laughs> you got ice in your veins if you don't cry at that one. I, maybe All the President's Men. And uh, and the Godfather Part Two. I, now you now it's now it's just now now it's, it's, it's just getting out of hand. It's getting out of hand, guys. It's yeah. getting out what, of hand. What are your three favorite? Uh, it would be I Shawshank, <laughs> Shawshank Redemption, Shawshank, okay. Fight Club. Oh wow! Um, okay. And The Matrix. Wow. Yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah, those are three that always kind of stay in the top five. It will kind of vary, and there's many other ones I have, but those three that always kind of like that's a good around of kind of where my sensibilities lie is yeah. comedies go. I think ghostbusters uh, airplane. I mean, I can't, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I mean, how can you not watch airplane and just piss yourself? 
all yeah. the blazing saddles i mean yeah how can you uh, not I mean, like now i want to put it. all those on my Spa- list. I space balls i mean how can you not watch Sp- and if you're a star a star wars fan like how can you not enjoy space balls i mean come it's on it's an impossible question you've asked an impossible <laughs> question. that's why i said it's the toughest question of all of them yeah, yeah. now right. where can people find out more about the book uh where they can they buy it and where they can they find more about your work uh, the book you can buy at this point pretty much anywhere. It comes out on May 1st. You can pre-order it on Amazon. Or I'm sure by the time this airs, mm-hmm. you can just get it on Amazon. Also so, on uh, MWP.com. Right. The, the Michael publisher Weezy is Michael publisher. Weezy Publications. And mm-hmm. you can get it from their website. Uh, you can get it in brick and mortar stores, Barnes & Noble. Where all, fine book stores are, where all fine books are sold. Where, where Exactly. <laughs> Uh, here and abroad. And uh, you can visit us also online at Mm bulletproofscript.com. And you can order the book through there as well. And uh, yeah. Or come to our houses. (laughs) Our address are. (laughs) And you can just leave some money, right? Slip it under the door and I will hand a book out to you. Slip it through the the mail slot. I appreciate (laughs) it. Guys, it has been an absolute joy talking to you today. Thank you so much for dropping some amazing knowledge bombs on the tribe today. I truly, truly appreciate all your wisdom, your laughter, and uh, your information today. So thank you so much. It's-